All right, peeps, on today's episode of The Kung Fu Genius, the genius will be talking to legendary martial arts actor Richard Norton. Lots of gems, lots of fight in Sammo Hung, and lots of, I'm not here to protect you from them. I'm here to protect them from you. Let's get to it. And every day, I practice martial arts. Watch <laughs> out. So, Richard Norton, welcome to the Kung Fu Genius Podcast. Thank you, Alex. It's a, it's a pleasure to be on your show, mate. I, I watch you regularly. Wow. And, and but I love it because both of you, you know, all the, all the ones associated are, are actually, it's awful I'm saying this, are actually quite bright. You know what I mean? I, I, get, <laughs> I get some of the shit that's spoken about and everything like that, and I get a kick out of that because... You know, if we can't have a laugh about what we do, then we're in a lot of trouble. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great. Right. Well, that really means a lot to me coming from you. It's incredible. I have uh, just to show the audience the first mm. time. So the first real book I had ever gotten as a child was the uh, martial art movies from Bruce Lee to the ninjas by Rick Myers, who's also a friend of mine. And I can show you the first photograph I ever saw of Richard Norton is this one right here. Put that there for the camera. Uh, that was the first time I ever saw you. Although I had seen the movie The Octagon and had no idea that you were the ninja. Um, but that was the first photo I'd seen of you. I remember your, your arms and that kick and just go, oh, this guy looks totally awesome. So you've been at it for quite a while. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about your martial arts background before we get into, uh, into the film. So you're from uh, Melbourne area, is that correct? Correct, Melbourne, Australia. All yep. right, and you started with with judo, though you didn't start immediately with karate. Is that right? No, I started with judo. I would have been eleven years of age, and God help me, that's nineteen sixty one. We're talking about that okay. I started. And you know, as I've often said, one of the reasons was judo because that was about the only martial art we knew of here in Australia. I mean, obviously, there would have been other forms of the arts and everything. But I often laugh. It was I, I came across judo as ads on the back of comic books, you know, and the typical ad, you know, defeat five assailants with the flick of a wrist or a finger. And I just remember as a kid, you know, I was very skinny and very small, especially as an 11-year-old. So the, the whole idea of a bit of physical strength and power was quite intriguing to me. So this kid moved opposite to where I lived in Croydon. That's about 20 miles out of Melbourne. And he was disappearing twice a week. And I said, where are you going? His name was Morris. And he said, oh, I'm, you know, doing judo classes. And I was like, oh, my God, I want to go. So his dad used to drive us, and I started doing that a couple of days a week. Um, you know, my memories of that are the older teenage judo students. I was like a cartoon character getting chucked from one end of the dojo to the <laughs> other. You know? so the whole idea of beating five assailants with one finger wasn't quite working out for me. Um but it was it was my introduction. I loved that we had a it was a policeman that was running the school. You know, it was in a church hall, all that normal stuff. But it was a terrific introduction to the arts. And then a little later in high school, a friend who was also doing judo told me about a karate demonstration that was going to be happening. I would have been fifteen, I think, at that stage, and um, it was being conducted by Tino Severano, who we'll talk about. Hawaiian Filipino, who had only been out in Australia, what, six months. He was teaching Goju, Goju Ru or Goju Kai school at that stage. And I went along and watched that demonstration, and that pretty much changed my life. You know, it was a very fundamental demonstration of, you know, H pattern kata as we know it, and a little bit of Jukumite, which was very much a Japanese you know, brought into the Goju system. I know the Okinawans don't spar, but in Japan they started to. But I just saw that as intriguing for somebody smaller that could use a bit of speed and not have to rely on actual strength. Because anyone that tells me judo doesn't involve a certain amount of strength and power, I'm I'm not having it, you know. Yeah, so, right, right. You know, so it, that, that whole idea of karate intrigued me anyway, but that just started a whole new journey. Wow, that's fantastic! And how long did you did you practice um, 
So you had, how long had you done judo and then how long did, uh, before you started practicing karate? Well, I, I was in judo for at least three years. It's okay. hard to remember it's how long ago, but I think I got to junior brown belt. But again, you know, I'm a kid, you know, 12, 13, 14 days that age. And it was fun though, because, you know, my friend across the road and another little friend up the street, we got to roll around in the grass and practice all things judo and, you know, run around in their geese and everything. It was, sure. it was a very memorable time, but. So I did that for a few years. I'm thinking uh, I probably I th always thought I was a bit younger. I did start messing around with judo from about the age, uh, sorry, karate when I was 14, because one of my high school friends was learning karate out of Masayama's book oh. uh, on karate way back. Mm -hmm. I, I have that. I have that book right here next to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was one of the few ones we had access to, and. He would come to high school and it was almost like what we would know now as party tricks. You know, he would, he was starting to build up his psyche knuckles, you know, and put a few calluses on them and stuff. And he would sure. break boards and do all that stuff. You know, it was a little bit like a, a, a party show. And, but again, enough to intrigue the shit out of me, you know, sure. so I'd go <laughs> to the house. And he would have learned, it was all out of a book. You know, we didn't have, <laughs> as you know, at my age, we didn't even have a video back then, let yeah. alone access to YouTube or internet or anything like that. So pictures in a book, he would show us kicks on a heavy bag. And, and it was just, again, it was just, um, it's so intriguing to me. And to have this demonstration and, a, and an actual instructor start to want to run a school very close to Nero lived was just a dream come true for me you know so again 65 66 was when i started actual lessons as opposed to you know in this high school friend's garage at the time sure 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 and the training under um uh, so was he did you call him sensei uh, did you address him as sensei or yes, sensei. um your yep. sensei Siberano, was it was it a lot of forms was was a sparring what was the training like you know, it was time. very traditional in nature, you know, it was, um, it was, you know, and as you know, a lot of the arts and the way they taught have evolved, you know, even sure. from when I started it, even though they are traditional in nature, you know, and supposedly keep the same shape and form they had, whatever it was, you know, 100, 150 years ago. But we would do just, you know, hundreds of basic blocks and strikes. We would do... You know, uh, Yaksuko Kumite, you know, one person and punch, and you do a certain defensive measures against that. Kata was a big part of it, and Ju Kumite was a big part of it. And you would know that what that is. But for the listeners, you know, Okono and Goju, you know, which is where the Japanese Goju basically originated from, and Okono and Goju came from White Crane Kung Fu, you know, in parts of China. But anyway, the Okinawans didn't spar. You know, their their application of karate through the bunkai and the exploitation of kata was more about civilian self-defense. It wasn't about jumping around and scoring points. I believe that the, the uh, it was introduced in karate in, in Japan more as a way they wanted something that would appeal to universities, and it was more about character development, et cetera, et cetera. So they just wanted something that would be good for students that would be safe because, again, it wasn't really contact, even though there was a certain degree of contact. So that's that was introduced. So Duke Day, I'm sorry, I'm waffling on here with Tina, was very much a part of what he learned in Hawaii because Tina's basis was in Mr. Ushulo or Sensei Ushulo in, in uh, Hawaii was his instructor and we just love the Duke Kumite, you know, because you get to spar and three and five minute rounds and everything else and score theoretical points. Mm -hmm. So I would say that, you know, they were the days there was no protection over the knuckles or the feet, unlike as it turned out later on due to injuries, but it was full on. The way Hunchy Tino, as he is now, taught the Duke Kumite, it wasn't about a point. It was about just continuous pressure. You know, as it were, if you sure. swept somebody to the ground, you would keep throwing punches and kicks. So 
I, I just look back now and know it was a phenomenal grounding for me as a martial artist because right. you know yourself, when you start martial arts, you don't know whether your instructor's good or bad because you don't know anything. It's right. only years later to, with hindsight, you either go, well, I wasted a lot of time and money, or I look back in my case and say, I couldn't have had a better start to my martial arts journey wow. with, wow. with what uh, Tina Sensei was showing us. Teaching us. Incredible. And you're very adept um, with the the weapons as well, with the Okinawan weapons. Uh, was was that also something you learned early on or did that come later? Where in the progression did you start learning those weapons? No, that was in a few years into my training with, with uh, Tino Sensei. He had a, another, it was actually a scene of Sal Eben as you came out to Australia some years later that Tino trained with in Hawaii. And Sal was the first one I saw using Sai, you know, Okinawan weapon. People always call them swords. They're not technically not swords. They're more of a, a trudgeness, you know, a dagger-like instrument. But anyway, I saw him, and I was intrigued with that when I saw him using that. And, of course, he explained it was an extension of your empty hand technique, etc. cetera. Anchi Tino also introduced it to the bow or the staff, and... Um, we, so I, I would I would say though it would have been around a brown belt level when I really took an interest in the Okinawan weapons, Tonfa, so I, all of those weapons, and I, Sai became my favourite weapon, which, as you could see, I ended up using an octagon, um, yeah. which started a real. It was funny. It started a frenzy of Sai sales in the US because a lot of people yes. had Sai being used. So now, yes, that started in my early years with Tino, and I, I, I was quite intrigued. I like Cyan mainly because, you know, as you know, we, a lot later, even in the Bruce Lee after End of the Dragon, Nunchoku became a very, I, I just felt it was a very un, misunderstood and misused weapon because it was almost like a toy. Kids of all ages and right. descriptions without a martial arts background were flailing around with it, these things where I saw Cy is something you couldn't carry away around with you. It wasn't a weapon you could use in the street. So it became just my own personal expression of my empty hand karate techniques. And that's that's why I enjoyed it very much, you know. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, I remember that big Sai boom. Uh I was much younger at that time, but I, all the martial art magazines, every martial arts retailer had a, had the size and the cases and everything and the instructionals. And uh, and even recently, although a Sai is not a Wing Chun weapon, but I got a bit of a Sai bug the last couple weeks uh, or last couple months. And I bought myself a pair and I've been playing around with them because uh it, I just find it such a fascinating weapon. And even going into the history of them, how they were used by the police in Okinawa, I mean, it's a very practical and very, uh, um, very interesting weapon. Really, I, w I would love to learn more about it. So I have to find someone who can teach me properly. Yeah, and just to add, you know, what helped, What was interesting for me was I had a friend who trained in Indonesia, you know, doing silat, pancet silat in different sure. forms. and. He he found me, you know, I used to do a lot of demonstrations in the early 70s, and he tracked me down because I was using Sai. It turned out he was also had learned Sai in Indonesia, and they call it Chaban in Indonesia, which basically means twig or branch, you know, because of the shape with the forks. Right. I didn't even know that, you know, there was a weapon that was used there, and hence... Some of the, you know, it was very fundamental in octagon, uh, you know, but some of the twirling, you wouldn't do that in with the way the Japanese use They tell you to stop playing games. But <laughs> within the, with a lot of the twirling, a bit like you use nunchaku, so it disguises the intent of the weapon and where the strike or blocks were coming from. So I learned a lot from him. And as I said, some of the twirls, I, I got to use an octagon, which was fun, you know, and again, just a bit of a different expression as far as what the normal Okinawans would use Sai for. Absolutely. Awesome. So um, one thing that I got really excited about when I looked into your, your past and what you had done, I guess, prior to getting into films was that you were a bodyguard and you were just not a bodyguard for anyone. You were a bodyguard for quite a number of very famous musicians. 
and talking to Mikey here, uh, who's who's a big music head, uh, we got very excited about some of the people that you had done bodyguard work for. But I just wanted to find out first before we get into some of these individuals, how did you even land into that kind of work? I mean, you, you see, I mean, you, you had to have some kind of way in. So how, how did you get how did you get into bodyguarding? Yeah, and the key word you use there is what it's all about. You have to have a way in, meaning that you, you don't become a bodyguard by sending in a resume or whatever, especially for the clientele that I ended up working with. And how that started was uh, Bob Jones was a fellow student in Goju. Bob started just a little bit after I did with Tina Hunchy. And uh, Bob was 10 years older than I. He was already running a lot of security uh, companies in Melbourne for the, a lot of the clubs and the discos. Always the last one to say discotheques. That really dates me. But, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's like run things of Saturday night. But um, so he, he, Bob wanted to. I became good friends with Bob, you know, and he was very physically powerful, very strong. Had an incredible reputation as a street fighter back in the day because of what he did. Bob wanted to start a leave after a certain amount of years with Hunchy and start his own style, which we called Zendo Kai back in the day. It's not an actual translation, but our loose translation of Zendo Kai was the best of everything in progression. We wanted something that would be not purely A style. Anyway, cut to 1970, we started Zendo Kai, and a couple of years into Zendo Kai, we worked the uh, our our idea of Woodstock, you know, it was called the Sunbury Pop Festival. Okay, we did all security for that because, uh, again, let me let me add that when we started Zendikai, because of what Bob did for a living, most of our students were either doormen or bouncers or security people. So there was a certain attention, you know, to that line of work and and work that came out of that. And there was a, a gentleman named Paul, uh, Paul Dainty who was a one of the biggest entrepreneurs in Australia who used to bring a lot of the rock and roll acts and pop acts out to Australia. So in 73, he gave Bob a call and asked if Bob and I would be interested in looking after the Rolling Stones. Wow. Who were just about to come. Yeah, what a, what an intro to that whole world, you know. Incredible. Oh wow, wow. Yeah, so, so that's how it all started was through Bob and it was through Paul Dainty wanting us to work and – you know, it, that was an amazing uh, uh, tour to do. You know, I ended up teaching Mick Jagger karate at four in the morning, you know, to yes, yes. and shit like that. <laughs> and uh, it, it was a phenomenal time. And that's then because it was so successful, at least from the band's point of view and ours, every time Paul brought one of the big acts out, of course, he wanted us to do all the security, as in the personal bodyguard work. And he brought Joe Cocker out and Fleetwood Mac and Linda Ronstadt and James Taylor and on and on it goes. I ended up working with ABBA and it was really just a result of word of mouth and, and basically being in that scene. And a lot of the work also came from the bands that, you know, if you if you were working for someone like, that's how I got working with, I'm jumping ahead now with John Belushi, you know, I was working Linda out in a dressing room in New York because she was about to do Saturday Night Live. And John Belushi came in and saw me just stretching Linda out and getting her all limbered up and everything. I used to do that just to relax her, you know, no matter what the show was. And John seeing me with Linda, that was all it took for John. I was the only one he wanted now to be his wow. bodyguard. Wow. And he didn't Incredible. know me. You, you get what I'm saying? So it was yeah. more like, well, he, he, he was such a friend of Linda's. He thought, oh, well, if Linda's using me, then I must be the one to to have, you know, sure, around here. Sure. So I ended up working with John and during the Blues Brothers movie, got to meet, you know, uh, Ray Charles and Aretha Franklin. It was another amazing experience, but that's another story. Well, are you? By the way, don't mean to cut you off. Telling you that's how it all started. Uh -huh. Well, I don't mean to cut you off, but are you ever going to write a book with all these stories? This would be a fascinating book or documentary. Yeah, yeah this is incredible. This is incredible. No, I, I have. I've got about three hundred pages of a book written with a friend of mine because I'm not a writer per se. But this was ten years ago. We've we've come out with a whole lot of chapters. Here's the thing, though, Alex. I knew when people asked me about it, they said, oh, you need to write a book. Not 
Not you, by the way. Well, right. maybe not you. I've, I've, you. I've, written, I've written six already. Oh, wow. No, yes. but I, I'm getting to I, – I knew the reason a lot of them were suggesting I write it was because they wanted all the juicy stories about the sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Sure. And I no, I get that, you know, and I knew everything that went on because we can get into how personal being a bodyguard is, but – I was with them everywhere. I had an adjoining room when they went out to eat, when they went to clubs or whatever. So I knew everything went on, and I just said, no, I would never, I never want to be that that butler that writes the kiss and tell book 20 sure, years later. Sure, sure. Yeah, that's understandable. Yeah. But then I thought about it, and I thought, you know what? I, what would be interesting is I, if I could write a book, and I, I'm paraphrasing now about lessons I learned from people at the top of their game. And nobody's more at the top of the game than, than a, a Mick Jagger or a Keith Richards or a James Taylor, for instance. I mean, sure. James is coming out in April to Australia again. How long has he been on the road? You don't get to have those sorts of careers without behavior, behaving in a certain way. You know, it's a bit like us as martial artists. We don't last this long without having the incredible passion for what we do. So I thought if I could put in a book things I'd learned from Linda or from Agnetta in Abba or, or whatever, or, or people like um, David Bowie who I was with for ten, uh, eight years, I thought it might be interesting to write those lessons in a way that a reader could read a chapter. Not I don't, didn't want to write a book about Richard Norton on the road boring you know but if i could write a chapter and give a lesson that i learned from them and that that reader could relate it to their own lives in some way and and basically get a benefit from it and it was very much about being in the moment you know about being aware when somebody talks that there's possibly something to learn from these people rather than I'm kind of listening. I'm more interested in what I'm going to say. You know right. what I mean? And, and I wanted people to be aware of that. And I also realized that a lot of the lessons I learned, I learned at that moment from these amazing people. And I include Jackie Chan and Chuck Norris and all these people, by the way, in this, that, you know, sometimes it was years later that I would go, oh, God, now I get what that person was trying to say. Hence the name of the book I decided which would be fun is in the moment with hindsight. So, wow. you know, some of it right then and there, some of it much later. And I was sure. trying to sort of have an overriding message of, of just again, listening a little more and being aware that this, I believe there's no such thing as coincidences when we meet certain people and to be open to the fact in that moment that there's possibly something you can learn from that person right. and not just be full of yourself and what you want to say or do. So we'll see. It's 10 years since I've even looked at it. But you know what? I know it would take six months of sitting down and just focusing on that. I just haven't had whatever, you know, the impetus to do that. But 10 years later, the journey still continues, so there's still a lot to add to those chapters anyway. Yeah. Hey, everyone, just want to let you know Wing Chun Illustrated is now offering a paperback edition through Amazon, reaching a larger global market. And no, they're not ditching the glossy magazine edition through MagCloud. You can now simply choose the version of this magazine you prefer and the one with the cheapest shipping wherever you live. Order your copy of Wing Chun Illustrated today across 12 Amazon marketplaces with free shipping for Prime members. Go and check that out. Great. Well, I would, I would love, I would look very much forward to reading that book. So I want to hear some stories about this time bodyguarding. Now I know you have a story about Linda Ronstadt here in my city of New York um, and potentially even our old ex mayor, Ed Koch. So I would love for you to tell our listeners this awesome story. I'm not allowed to, Alex. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, there's, a, there's a lot I have, by the way, but one that's kind of fun. I'll tell you two. You know, I want to tell you two stories about Linda because there's one about, which is quite funny, and there's another about illustrating what the book would be about and a particular lesson that I picked up, which for martial artists I think they could particularly relate to. But anyway... I was in New York for quite a amount of time when Linda way back was doing Pirates of Penzance in Central Park. Joe Papp was a legendary producer. So Linda was the lead in this show. We were staying over in Central Park West, 
And rather than get taxis and stuff, we used to like walking through Central Park over to the theatre you know, that was built in the park. And later on, I believe it was a Savoy. I could be wrong where it became, you know, a theatrical production there. Anyway, walking through the park one day, I'm, I'm uh, by the way, you know, as a bodyguard with Linda or anybody, I was very aware from a legal point of view that I wasn't allowed to just see somebody that was annoying him go up and <laughs> shake the shit out of him, you know. <laughs> yeah. You're not allowed to do that because they also knew there wouldn't be Richard Norton Punch as a fan. It'd be Linda Ronstadt's bodyguard hit somebody, and there's all sorts of legal issues with that. Anyway, yeah. so I'm walking along and I see this photographer sitting on a bench, you know, a little bit up. And uh, I said to Linda, and by the way, Linda would walk from the park to the theatre, no makeup on, you know, because it was all, she was very, very earth in that way, which means you wouldn't particularly want your picture taken is the point of that. So I'm walking along, I said, Linda, look, there's a photographer there, just get on this side of me and I'll try and block you. We're walking along, the photographer gets up and he's got his camera there and I say, look, you know, can you wait, Jess, there'll be a press do after the show and everything, you know, and you'll have access to Linda there. And he's walking backward with his camera up like this over my head, you know, taking snapping pictures of Linda. And I'm saying, look, you know, don't be a dick for God's sakes, you know, you, all the normal stuff. I won't go into the language, but <laughs> suddenly, <It's okay. laughs> suddenly Linda runs from behind me and grabs his shirt and tie and just rips his shirt and tie and it's basically just totally assaulting this photographer who, 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 who almost like it was like, what the f am I into? And he's like, oh, you've done it this time. I'm, I'm going to file a police report and blah, 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 blah. And I'm kind of like, yeah, just fuck off, you know, get away. <laughs> that sort of stuff. So, so there's that. So I'm already laughing about that. We get to the show and it was in the theater. And again, it might be the Savoy. I might have got that wrong, but whatever. So at the end of the show, the mayor. Uh, which I'm pretty sure was still Koch at that time. Ed Koch comes backstage to meet Linda, you know, because he'd been to the show. He's got an entourage of ladies with hair up and jewels and everything like that. And um, so I'm standing there. Peter Asher, who was Linda's manager at the time, said, oh, just, just stand back. You know, it's the mayor and his entourage. It's all good. Linda's in a dressing and comes out without any makeup, just in a dressing gown to meet the mayor. Of course, suddenly one of the mayor's entourage is this same photographer we just had this altercation with in the park, who again puts his camera up high and starts taking pictures of Linda. Linda sees this, runs around again and grabs his camera and smashes the guy's camera on the floor. And bless her heart, I've got to use language, she was literally like, you sucker, I should have... I should have put your face in in the park and everything like that. Just disappears after smashing his camera and disappears into the dressing room. And you've got the mayor, the mayor standing and he's like, uh, <coughs> <laughs> I think it was the funniest thing to which I said later to Linda, I said, now I get why I'm working for you. I'm here to protect them from you. <laughs> it's not the other way around. That was a pretty funny incident. There was another one with uh, Edge Cot, which I love to tell you I was doing. Uh, we were working in Central Park at Sheep's Meadow, you know, yes. where a lot of concerts were held. And James Taylor was one of the acts, and Bruce Springsteen was there. But James wow. was doing, you know, a concert to help support and raise money for this particular Sheep's Meadow, this part of Central Park. Anyway, I was standing there and a little bit back from James, and Ed Koch is there, and suddenly this... Uh, one of his assistants came over and said, um, basically, oh, Mr. Mayor, there's some of the rich people up on the hill are complaining about the noise because you can imagine rock and roll in an open air park. And it was just, and so he's telling the mayor about this noise and I'm looking at the mayor and think, God, I wonder how he's going to respond for this. Is he going to shut it down or whatever? And he's got his head down for a moment and suddenly looks up and he says, Come. Come, he says. That was his reaction. Everything went on as normal. I said, oh, how good is that? You know, it was a wonderful one. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Ed Koch. Yeah, he was he was funny. He would even make do cameos in films and stuff. He was quite the character. Yeah, no, I mean, just it just 
I, I just love, I've often said, you know, that when I work with people like Linda James, whoever, David, I get to see the real person, you know. I don't get to see the act that's on stage and a sure. persona they love have going along with that act. And little moments like that, even seeing the mirror of New York. I mean, I'm in Australia, I'm in the States, I'm in New York, you know, in the Big Apple, and I'm seeing the, the mirror where we all, all know it's a big deal. And to just see such an a personal side of somebody like that. It just tickled me. You know, I thought that was fantastic. <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah, that's incredible. Uh, so you, you, you do the bodyguarding for a bit. Was that also then your door into films eventually, or was that separate from that? How did, how did you that, get into films? That was separate. Now in 1978, Bob Jones, you know, my partner in Zendikai went over to the States and I'll cut it short, happened to meet up with Chuck Norris and ended up bringing Chuck Norris out to Australia. Chuck had just done Good Guys Wear Black and Break a Break, a couple of his very, very early films. So he was interested in promoting them in Australia. So Chuck wanted him to come out and help promote some of the very first kickboxing tournaments ever held in Australia. Um, and so I ended up doing demonstrations in each of our states or capitals here in Australia, I was demonstrating Sai and Bo, and uh, Chuck was also demonstrating on the same card, and that's how we became really good friends, even just off that trip that Chuck did to Australia. Mm. Cut to the f next, and by the way, at the end of that, Chuck said to me, look, if you do ever end up in America, give me a call, love to do some training with you, which again, for a little kid that grew up in Croydon to get an invitation like that from Chuck Norris, you know, who back then, for those who wouldn't know on um, uh, old enough would know Chuck was such a legend in American martial arts at that time. So it was an incredible uh, opportunity. I never dreamed I'd actually end up in America, but a year later in 79, uh, Linda got in touch with me and wanted me because I'd worked with Linda also in 78 in Australia. And she wanted me to go and work for her full time in the U S I wasn't even sure about that. I had schools here, I was teaching, I had a girlfriend, I had all that stuff. And it was a big, big move to, for me to jump out of a little pond into such a big pond. Sure. Uh, Linda was the one that ended up being with a conversation when I was umming and ahhing. She said, look, why don't you try it? You can always go back home. And I never forgot that because that's when I went, you know what? You're right. You know, I, I've got to take a chance. Hence, by the way, I often give advice, and then sometimes I would sign eight by tens for some of the films, and I would write "dare to participate," because I realized that if I hadn't dared to step out of my little comfort zone and go to the states, I couldn't imagine what my life would have turned out like. And it was taking a chance to sort of dare to participate in a whole new environment. So off I went to the states to start working with Linda and living with Linda in Malibu, you know, on the colony. And wow. uh, of course, the first person I called was Chuck Norris. And Chuck said, oh, yeah, let's train. So I, I ended up training with Chuck every day, six days a week for a matter wow. of years. And of course, you know, in 79 was when Chuck was in pre-production for the Octagon. And it was because I was always training with him every morning and we were such good friends when he asked me if I would consider playing his nemesis, Keo, who was the crimson hooded mast enforcer in Octagon. So, of course, I jumped at the opportunity. We we worked out a lot of the fights with his brother Aaron in, the, in Chuck Norris's backyard, figured out a lot of the fights because, as you know, I, Chuck was using katana or sword, you know, against Sai. Yeah. And we put the fights together in his backyard. I still have old footage of some of those rehearsals, by the wow. way, which is fun. And uh, the rest is history. So that's how my intro into movies came about. I ended up doing a few movies with Chuck, and um, I got an offer to do audition for Force 5, which is that picture you showed in the beginning was from Force 5. I had to audition for Bob Klaus and Freddie Weintraub, who were the producer and director of Into the Dragon. So I ended up auditioning for that. There was probably a hundred of some of the top martial artists in the country. Um, and I ended up getting one of the leads as Ezekiel, go figure, right? Ezekiel, you know, and uh, one of the leads in Force 5. So 
that led to a whole career in, you know, in the lower budget sort of action genre of martial arts movies that we did in the 80s and 90s. And the date, I've probably done 90 movies now and wow. a certain amount of vision. But it came from Chuck wanting me to work with him in Octagon. Of course, I met uh, Tadashi Yama, Yamashita, sure. who was my boss, the, the enforcer, Secula. And uh, I ended up training with him for a number of years. It so much came from that early time. You know, Chuck introduced me to Bill Wallace and Benny the Jet Okidas, who I wow. worked with in Force 5. And so Chuck was instrumental in opening a lot of doors for me that, as an Aussie, I would never have had open, wow. you know, and, and I never forget that and feel very fortunate to have had his friendship, which I still have today. Chuck was actually best man at my wife, Judy, and my wedding. Wow. <clears throat> yeah, and I always love and we stayed with Chuck six months ago in Hawaii, so we're still good friends, and God help me, what is it, since 1978, so that's that's quite something as well. Yeah, that was the year after I was born, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Alex. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, wow, that, that, that's really fascinating. And the Octagon is also, it's really the first of the ninja movies because there was a huge ninja boom mainly by canon, but I think people don't realize that the Octagon was kind of the first one because it, it predated like all those show Kasugi films. So you are, you are a trendsetter in, in, in the whole nin 80s ninja boom. Well, that's really, really incredible. Yeah, it, it, it was phenomenal. And again, you know, when you do something of note, at the time you never consider the importance of it in your life. It's only a million years later, like, you know, some of the later movies, you know, it's fight corner around in the last, two Suicide Squad movies and Mad Max movies we'll talk about later. But it's when you you start telling stories and you see some of the younger martial artists who are stunties and their eyes are like this, that you realize, you know, how much a part of that history you are through movies like Octagon and working with Chuck in such early days and being with somebody like Chuck who, you know, was obviously good friends with Bruce Lee. You know, it's only later that you go, wow, that's that's a very cool to have been part of that whole journey. Right. You know? Right. And, wow. Uh, yeah, I feel very fortunate. As I said, I'm still, I often say with the movies, you know, all this time later, and what, movies for about 45 years now that, you know, it's it's the journey, it's the people you meet and some of the martial artists. I mean, to to be such close friends with people like Benny the Jet, yeah. who, kid, who I met, you know, again, before the Jet Center even started working with him, Force 5. And again, you know, what, what, how fortunate am I have to have such a role model as he in in my, my martial arts sort of life. And even Octagon, Philip and Simon Ree, who you probably know, they... Sure. They were in that. I got to meet them. Gerald Okamura. There was quite a number of people I met in Octagon that I'm still friends with to this day that have all gone on to do amazing things in film and everything else as well, as well as being just incredible martial artists, you know. So, right. yeah, it's great. So one of my favorite films, because I'm a big Hong Kong film nerd, so one of my favorite films uh, that, that you're in is a Twinkle, Twinkle, Lucky Stars where you have – an amazing fight scene with uh, one of my favorites, Sammo Hung. I met Sammo Hung actually in my first trip to Hong Kong in 96 by accident. He was in the hotel I was staying at. I was having breakfast. He walked by and I uh, I, I just couldn't believe it. It was like for, for me, it, it was the one star I wanted to meet. If you gave me a choice, I would have said Sammo Hung. He walked into the hotel. He was so nice to me. You know, they say never meet your heroes unless your hero is Sammo Hung. He was amazing. He was nice. He took time. He took a photo with me. He signed my book. And I'll never, ever forget that. And you have, I think, one of my favorite fight scenes with Sammo, which is there at, at the end of the film. How did you how did you even get hooked up with uh, with Sammo? Or, or, and was that actually your first Hong Kong film or had you made had you done anything in Hong Kong before that? No, that, that was my first Hong Kong movie. And wow. how that started was through Pat Johnson, mm -hmm. who in peace, passed away recently. Right. Pat worked with Jackie on The Big Brawl. Remember The Big Brawl? That's right, which that's right. For Warner first. Brothers, so, yeah. Well, Pat was very close friends and an ex-partner of Chuck Norris's. So I ended up training with Pat in the very early years. Pat was the one that recommended to Jackie that I might be a good 
person for him to use in one of his movies. Uh-huh. So I remember being in, I was in a little uh, city town near Osaka in Japan. I was on tour again with Linda. And I was sitting in my hotel room and I got a call. God knows how they found me. I got a call with this Asian lady who starts to say, oh, hey, this is da-da-da. I work for Jackie Chan. He wants you to work with me in, in a movie. What's your price? <laughs> I said, well, <laughs> wait a minute, what? You know, well, Jackie, what you come and work with him in a movie? What's your price? That was the phone. I said, well, hold on, first of all, when do you need me? And she said, oh, you would need to be here in about three days. And I said, well, unfortunately, that's impossible. I'm committed to this tour. You know, I've got another two months of this tour. We were traveling all over the world. So that that's where that finished. And I didn't think a lot of it. I thought, well, that's the end of that. By the way, what's interesting about that before I go on is I did a podcast with Keith Vitale, who you would know sure. from working, being a legendary point fighter himself in American martial arts. Keith didn't even know this, but the role that they wanted me to play was the role that Keith Vitale ended up playing, you know? In, wheel, in Wheels on Meals, right? Wheel, yes. Which, you know, and of course, Benny was involved in one of the, you know, iconic fight scenes with Jackie. Now, anyway, that, that was it because Keith got a call with, again, a couple of days' notice asking, would he be available to go and work? And off he went and did it. But that was a role apparently they were offering me. So I thought, that's it. And, and also, I want to say that I, it's not like I, even though I was in martial arts, yes, I knew of Jackie Chan, but it's not like I was a diehard, watched every. Chinese movie or, you know, whatever that came out of there with Jackie and everybody. So whatever amount of time later, I got another call asking if I would work with him, and that was Twinkle Twinkle Lucky Stars. So we agreed, you know, did all the deal. I had an agent at the time. Off I go. I'm sitting in a plane on the way over thinking, oh, this should be great. I'll be able to do this and that. You know, I'm going through my head, (laughs) my sort of martial arts, which I'd like to do. Of course, nothing was further from the truth. It was like a talk about a, a introduction to Hong Kong movies because what I found was that they didn't give a flying <laughs> what I wanted to do. It was going to be what they tried <laughs> what, what they actually told me I had to do. I was also in Twinkle Twinkle. I was supposed to do a big fight scene with Jackie, but Jackie had injured his something about his shoulder blade in another film he was doing ah. at the same time. Hence me ending up doing that fight with Samo. I believe that wasn't originally the intention, Mm. but how blessed was I to have that opportunity? Because like you, some of the stuff when we started, you know, you remember one of the gags was I had to saw Jackie's, uh, Samo says, oh, you're going to swing a chair at my feet. He's on this table. I'm going to do a backflip and I will land here, blah, blah, blah. And I'm literally looking around for the stunt double because anyone who knows Samo, you know, he's portly, he's short, you know, and and I thought there's no way this guy's going to be able to do this. Of course, he ended up doing not only doing it, but as you would know, they're renowned for doing sometimes 15, 20, 30 takes if it takes it. Samo did this same gig like 15 times off the table, landing on his feet, and that was when I went, oh, my God, there's, there's a lot more to this guy than what I would have thought. So, you know, the fight scene was amazing. I got to meet uh, Shoju Karata. Karata-san was quite a famous Japanese martial artist. done 30-plus movies at that time in in, uh, Hong Kong. Got to be good friends with him. He was my partner, as you remember, in one of the scenes. He's fighting with Sai, ironically. Yes, yes. And and I'm fighting uh, Samo, but... It was it was an amazing experience, not only because um, of fighting with Samo, who, again, I wouldn't have known much about at the time. It's later on you realize, once again, how fortunate I am to have been right. able to do a number of movies with Samo. We became actually very good friends through through that film. I would often say it's not because I had any skills that nobody else had. It was due to Kurata. I was, I was, and after two days of filming the fight with Samo, Kalat gets here, I was getting quite frustrated because the way they, Sam and those boys, punch was very different. The timing was very different. The choreography was was different. There was contact that was quite excessive back in that day. 
And you could see I was getting a bit frust- frustrated. And he pulled me aside, Karata did, and he's, he was such a gentleman. He's, he basically said to me, look, if you want to do movies here in Hong Kong, he said, don't say anything. He said, and he was being nice. He was more or less saying they think they're God's gift to martial arts. It's their set. Just do and copy what they want you to do. doesn't matter how many times. And I, I took that advice. Samo and Jackie really respected I would take the bumps. I would go over tables because I was in very good shape back then. It didn't worry me. The type of training I did involved a lot of contact. So I was okay with that. And that's what led me to so much more work, not because I had skills that nobody else had, because obviously there's a lot better than me, but basically because I knew how they worked. I would accept the way they were. We were on the set 18 hours a day, seven days a week during that fight with Samo, which is ridiculous. And um, got through it and, and basically, you know, as I said, I formed, I formed good friendships with him, which also was important because – there really is a little circle and a big circle when you do those sort of movies, meaning the fact that Jackie took me shopping, looking for cameras, and Sam would take me out to dinner and stuff like that. His entourage, as it were, the stunt crew, oh, okay, he's he's in that inner circle, so they kind of left me alone. Because, and, I, and I'm telling this story because it's, it's truth. If you were one of the English, you know, expats living in Hong Kong that were often used in those movies, oh, man, they would have a hard time, you know. <laughs> I still have Vicky in my ear, not Jackie or some of the others. Oh, you stop it. You have no timing. You know, we need more power, you know, all that stuff. Like, oh, my God, you know, they would, they would cop it, you know. But clearly sure. I didn't go through that, but... As you know, I ended up doing Millionaires Express and City Hunter and Mr. Nice Guy with Jackie. And again, it was due to the twinkle, twinkle, just establishing not only the attack, the bumps, but I think you saw it might have seen a little clip where Jackie nicely was talking about me and basically said that I had the timing. You know, he wasn't about the strength or the power, the speed. It was more you needed to have a particular timing. It worked for his style of choreography. Now, I had that not because I could, was smart and could just figure that out. It it just was that way. Whatever, through my goju training or whatever, I just seemed to have the right time to work, which was just really fortunate, you know, that allowed, that allowed the fights to work the way they did because City Hunter was the same thing, you know. It's really the, the, his timing is very, very particular right. that makes it for him and for Samo. So, yeah. Versus that city, issue, that but city Hunter final fight scene, well, with the fight scene between you and Jackie is just bonkers with the sticks yeah. and pop, 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 pop and the play. It's so incredible. How, how long did it take to shoot that? into like, how, 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 how many days did you guys spend on that fight scene? Well, let me tell you with, with the fight scene with Samo in Twinkle, Twinkle took two and a half weeks Oh. I often did low budget movies, the whole movie in two and a half weeks. Never mind you, it wasn't <laughs> non stop because the difference before I get into that with the Hong Kong style is they, they don't really know what they're going to do after the first half a dozen moves, you know, as I've often talked about. So it's quite spontaneous, it's very organic. They would do the first three or four moves you would rehearse in front of camera, would take 30 takes to get what they want, and then they would all lie down and stunt mattresses and Basically, you have a little nap and think about the next few moves, whatever wow. they came up with. They would demonstrate what you wanted to do. There was no real rehearsal. Rehearsed in front of camera and off you went. Hence, it taking so long. City Hunter, uh, uh, you know, and again, they would have been shooting other stuff around it, but pretty much six and a half weeks it took for my fight scene in City Hunter, which is just insane. Wow. Wow. And, and, and you know, you talk about it, but it was fun. You know, when I'm shooting a movie like that, it wasn't until I saw a screening in Los Angeles of City Hunter that I got to see the rest of the movie because I'm only really there for what I'm shooting. You know, and I was a long time in Hong Kong. And, by, you know, even then I started, I did two weeks. Jackie hurt his ankle really bad, so they shut down for a month and a half or two months. I said to him, look, I can't do anything else. You have to keep me on the payroll, which they did. I went mm-hmm. to the Philippines and did the lead in another movie and came wow. back. <laughs> <laughs> just in the that. break. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just in the break, which was fun. But anyway, um, it was it was it's six and a half weeks, which is an incredible long time. But even that that 
thing with this, they didn't want me to look like a, a Kali dude or anything like that. They literally wanted me to look like the mad professor. <laughs> so, I, you know, when you see the shot, I'm looking in the camera, I'm like, yeah, I'm just going like a crazy person. But you know the other thing, Alex, I, I also realized early in the game, if you're not willing to understand that you're almost a caricature in those films, sure. you couldn't go along with the tongue-in-cheek humor of the choreography of the dialogue and everything else, then you really didn't belong in one of those movies, you know, and right. that was the other thing. So the Sea City Hunter, which, by the way, was made for a slightly younger audience than Jackie's regular audience it was directed by Wong Jing. Yes. Who was down for comedy there. And uh, who, by the way, that's how I ended up doing magic crystal, which we can talk about with Cynthia. Yes. Because of doing city hunter that Wong Jing got to work with me and see me that so that led on. But anyway, quite a journey, but I think city hunter was a, hoot. you know, it was yeah. uh, hilarious. Hey, Kung Fu Genius fans, if you like what we do here, please consider supporting us on Patreon. For as little as five bucks a month, you'll get early access to episodes and other goodies not posted on the Kung Fu Genius channel. With higher levels of support, you can get your name in the description, a live chat with me, or at the baller level, you even get your own personal KFG episode with me as my guest. The link to our Patreon page is in the description of this episode below. Patreons have a direct link to chat with me and get first dibs on any questions for asking me anything episodes click on the link in the description for our patreon page for more information and i'll see you on patreon so um the hong kong films especially at that time they were shot without sound because they were dubbed later either in cantonese or in mandarin so presumably in in all these films you shot in hong kong your your dialogue is not being recorded live so are you actually saying the words when you're speaking to the chinese actors or are you just making because i've heard like with some korean actors they just had them count one two three one two three like if they couldn't yeah. speak english um so were you were you aware of what the story was because i heard sometimes there wouldn't even be proper scripts so were you actually saying anything coherent while when you shot those movies well the, all the, all samo asked me to do with jackie was to make up something that would last approximately x amount of seconds Ah, I which see. would basically be the length of the Cantonese or Mandarin, uh, Mandarin, you know, stuff that would do. And by the way, for those who know, in those early, most of those early years, nobody ever heard Jackie's real voice because right. somebody else would dub him, dub him later on, you know, because as you say, there was no sound on set. You just winged it. And it's, you know, the, one of the catchphrases that came out of Even Twinkle was painful, you know. Yes, painful. Somebody <laughs> said, did you think of that? And I, I know, I'm sure it was Sam that came up with it because he's, he's got a unique sense of humor. Sure. And it's one of the lines that people remember most, you know. And I did say that. They did got, get me to do, because the, I, I told them very early, I was aware that they were going to get a different person. I didn't want to be sort of voiced by, say, an Asian gentleman or whatever. I wanted it to be my voice, which they agreed to. So a lot of that was recorded later. I got to actually do that, though, which was helpful. That the lines of, you know, painful and, you know, Samo's like, no, 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 no. And I say, how about now? And he basically says, I can't feel anything because my body's all numb. <laughs> right. Horny right. stuff. But yeah, it was my <laughs> voice. And, and as you say, it wasn't no sound. So we did, we did voice it. But I'm one of the few Westerns or Wilos that was actually able to use his own voice and have his voice used in these films later on. Incredible. And then you mentioned briefly Magic Crystals. So Magic Crystals is interesting for a couple of reasons. It's a bit of a sci-fi kind of film, uh, but it also has you as a kung fu guy, which you had never really done before. So how did they... Uh, uh, how, did you, how did you know, Alex? Was it this <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I heard you talking about it. I wasn't judging your performance all right. at all. I remember you, you had talked about it with someone else. Right? But yeah, I mean, you were, you were busting out all these Kung Fu shapes. So uh, who, yeah. who did, did Cynthia show you that? Did someone show you that? Or how, how, did, they, how did you or did you train specially to bust those shapes? Or, or how did that come to be? No, well, well, I was playing whatever Karloff. He was supposed to be a Russian KGB agent that happened to know all the different martial arts, you know. 
And we actually, Cynthia and I laugh about that because come that scene when she's on this table, you know, and she's got a sword, and I do this, you know, in, in Goju, we have mawashi, okay, it's called. We have a road, but if this was, no, 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 it has to be this way. And by the way, I was taught that by the fight coordinator. Oh, man, I feel so bad I can't think of his name because he's legendary. He did some really amazing choreography in later movies. It was not uh, Ting, Ting Siu Tong, right? Was it Ting Siu Tong for that film? And excuse my, my not remembering That's that. That's okay. Because he was amazing because still... Before I go on with that, some of the, like some of the fights with Asai and Andy Lau and with Cynthia was some of the best stuff for me that I've done, and that was due to his choreography. He was amazing. So yes, it was he that wanted me to do that, and Linda was just cracking up because she knew I didn't have a fucking clue what that move was. <laughs> but hey, it's a movie, right? Who really knows anyway? Except people like you, Alex. That's why you brought it up. Thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs> no yeah, problem. So, no uh, problem. That was no different than any other movie that I did in Hong Kong. You basically were shown by somebody in a spot what they wanted you to do. Now, I, the only thing I would say, Sai came up because they did ask me about weapons. They didn't know that I could use Sai, which was great because, you know, to get to use Sai in another movie like Magic Crystal and with a creative um, work of, say, a Hong Kong Fight coordinator. That was that was incredible opportunity for me because that was a lot of the spinning that I learned from, you know, this Indonesian style, and it was just a great chance to express Sai in a more of a comedic and slightly different way, you know. But yeah, mm-hmm. that just happened out of the blue. Incredible. Wong Jing was amazing, but you get back to those stories. I was in. I remember being in getting makeup on. Wong Jing would be lying sometimes next to me on. It almost looked like one of those lounges you lie by your swimming pool on and he's lying and he's giggling his head off because he's literally writing that day's script (laughs) and they didn't know what they were going to do so when you said there's often no script or story there was nothing what it's so for me i couldn't prepare for anything and most of the time i had no idea of how the scene I was about to be related to what came before or what was going to come after wow how difficult was that Wow. Yeah, because it, it, I think um, going back to Twinkle Twinkle, there was a time where I'm in an elevator with Kodata son and I'm supposed to run out and shoot or point a gun, I don't remember. And the AD, and by the way, there was sometimes three or four ADs and you never knew who was going to direct that day. It, it often, it was a very strange system. And he said, oh, um, we saw, this is the next day. He said, oh, in the edit, we saw you run out of the elevator. He said, you didn't quite you know, looked like you were shooting where you're supposed to. I said, no. And I said, now tell you what, the next scene that I do today, I'm going to look like I'm on my way to see Mickey Mouse in Disneyland until somebody tells me where the hell I just came from to give me some sense of the sure. scene on that. Because all I would say is, I've got the doors open, you're going to run out and point the gun and then you move camera left or right. Well, you know, yes, I get it. But as an actor, we at least need to know some intent of what the hell we're about to do. But that's 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 what the way it was. You just never knew what the story is about, where it was going to go. Which, and again, in some ways, as I said, was very organic, like their fight scenes. Samo would wait until he did a quick edit that night of whatever you shot. And it was then he would decide which direction he wanted to fight to go and how long or not he thought he wanted it to take. Whereas in America, for those that don't know, there's always a master. You always rehearse. You know exactly the length of the fight. You would do a master, which involves the fight from start to finish, and then you go and do over-shoulder coverage or inserts or whatever. Never happened in Hong Kong. They would just continually do the first from then they would move the camera, next few moves, move the camera, and that's how they gave a lot of... Uh, um, movement and everything else, wow. you know, and dynamics to their fights, which obviously work for them for their style of filmmaking. Sure. As an actor, though, uh, I, I assume the American style of making of doing fight choreography is a lot easier, right, and a lot more straightforward. Yes, and also quicker. You know, the reason that sometimes Jackie's films they take they shoot over a two year period. I mean, you can't do it. You know, you can't have an action film with a fight that takes six and a half weeks to shoot. Like I said, that's a whole movie. 
right? right? So it's very, very time consuming. But, you know, back then there were no unions, there were no overtime. The studies were paid kind of a small monthly retainer. So it wasn't a huge cost for them to be able to do that. Cut to Mr. Nice Guy that we shot in Australia where I play Jean Carlo. That's good casting. He was supposed to be a New York mafioso. I said, yeah. Aussie with blonde hair, that suits, that'll work. <laughs> but anyway, that, was, that was due to Samo wanting me for Mr. Nice Guy. Well, that was a different experience because you're in Australia, you do have unions, you have 10 hour days of shooting and everything else is overtime. That's what resulted in that particular incident. I was supposed to do a big fight with Jack at the end of the movie, but they, they went, I forget what it was, one or two months over and the production just basically shut it down. Mm. Hence, I death in front of this mining truck I wasn't even there when they shot that there, you know, because they just had to wrap everything up, Oh wow. which was disappointing. I remember saying to Sam, I said, oh, Sam, what's the point of using me if you're not going to have, a, you know, a nice big fight scene? I said, everybody's dying to see Giancarlo get his ass kicked, you know, by Jackie, because we had that thing where I've got elastic wraps around his wrist in the house, yes. and it was a bit of a comedic gag. And that was supposed to lead to, again, a big fight scene with us, but unfortunately we didn't get to do it, but there you go. Wow. Uh, so you've, uh, so in addition to your Hong Kong films, you also did a lot of, uh, like you said, kind of the more typical American low budget, uh, martial art films. Uh, you did a bunch with Cynthia, even with Don the Dragon Wilson, but you've also done some big stuff here in the States. So Mad Max Fury Road. I remember, uh, when I saw that on, uh, when I saw that in the movie theater, I, and I saw, I was like, wait, is that Richard Norton? I'm like, it looks like Richard Norton. And then I was like, no, nah, I'm going to go on IMDb. Oh my God, it's Richard Norton did that. It was amazing. Uh, that, what was it like to, wh by the way, um, it's, it's been a few years. Wh where did they shoot that movie? The, originally we rehearsed to shoot in Broken Hill, mm -hmm. which is, a mining sort of town or city in Australia in the outback. It was all supposed to be shot there. Unfortunately, they had unseasonable rains and suddenly everything turned green, like grass oh. shot up everywhere. And because the whole film was supposed to be this post-apocalyptic landscape, it no longer suited. So for whatever you know, decision-making, all the vehicles and everything ended up being put on ships and we ended up in Namibia. In Africa, you know, oh. way down south in, in Africa. And uh, that was why. It was really because the location just didn't didn't work out, you know, as far as being sparse and barren, which, by the way, the Australian outback is typically. But, again, the unseasonable rains change that. So, yes, we ended up in a city called Swakamon, which is a German sort of colony way back, and um, we were based there and we shot – and. When I landed, by the way, in Schwakamon, I go, I sort of went, oh, God, no wonder George wanted to shoot here because it was like landing in Alice Springs. I mean, you could go 100 miles and not see a tree in some wow. areas of that landscape. So it was a tough shoot, but, yeah, that's how we ended up there. I, you know, I, <laughs> as you could tell, it was very hard to recognize me because I had this gray beard and I had, had to shave my head. Yeah. That, yeah, that, by the way, I know I was a fight coordinator on that, but... I got to play that role. I was an imperator, which was the same sort of uh, warrior set as Charlize Theron's character who played Furiosa. And, you know, it, it's her fault. In fact, I did everything to try and keep my hair, you know, even saying to George Miller, who's a wonderful, wonderful man, he's like, he's like the sweet uncle you wish you had. But anyway... Uh -huh. But they said, but we're a more elite class. I mean, we'd be allowed to have hair. We'd be because everybody was supposed to look like scum rabbits too. They're supposed to look like they hadn't eaten in a million years. But anyway, so I'm talking away, and he seemed to be going along with it. And then one day, you know, in pre, I'm on the set, and George says, um, um, he used to talk like, "Would you um, just uh, uh, come with me?" And he puts his arm around me, and we're walking away. And on his phone, he's got a picture that Charlize has sent him from Los Angeles because she wasn't in the country yet, with her head shaved. She was supposed to have longer dreadlocks and everything, you know, blonde. She decided that she was this warrior woman. Why would I be fussing around with all this hair? So she shaved her head. So that was his way of saying to me, this has got to go. 
Oh, and wow. <laughs> afterwards, when I met Shelley, so I went up to Shelley's early in the shoot because I had to help, you know, train her and do some of the help with the choreography. And I said, you know, this is your fault. Tell the story. And she, she grabs my cheek and she goes, oh, but look at those little cheeks, you know. <laughs> And and I said, I'm traumatized. I said, I haven't had <laughs> shots since I was born. You know, I, I was worried about it looked like a racing tadpole or something with no hair. <laughs> then, then I get back to Australia and at the end of the shoot, I did a bit of training when I got back. I still had no hair, a bit of a beard, gray whiskers, you know, and I had a black eye because I'd copped a knee in the eye. Oh, my wife Judy's sitting in a restaurant. I'm across the street and I'm walking across to sort of sit down with her. And she, I get over and I sit down. And she said, "Wheaty, you look like an aging biker." <laughs> I was going to tell you straight. They're always going to tell you yeah, straight. Yeah, keeping it real sort of stuff. <laughs> well, anyway, that's the story. But again, yes, I ended up. And I, we just finished the latest uh, Furiosa, the Mad Max. Um, you know, that's going to be out, I think, in April next year. Oh, another, another oh, I didn't realize that. So uh, yeah, yeah, it's a sequel to the last one. Yes, we, we shot it all in Australia this time. I've worked out in different, uh, some in Sydney and some in uh, Hay, it's called, and Broken Hill. Uh, I got to do the fight choreography and uh, work on that. This story, though, is a prequel. It's 10 years earlier than Mad Max Fury Road, Fury Road. And it's really the story of how Charlize Theron's character became Furiosa. Mm. And because of that, uh, Anya Taylor-Joy, who was in The Queen's Gambit and a few movies you'd know. Oh, yeah, yeah. I've seen The Queen's Gambit, yeah. Blood. She's, she's uh, I think Anya's around 25, 26, so she's the lead. Chris Hemsworth is the lead bad guy. Oh. Uh, who's amazing. And that's also funny. So I'm, I'm away and I get a call, I call Judy after two weeks when I'm away shooting. She says, uh, how's the shoot going? I said, no, it's really great. I was training on your, you know, and some stuff. And she was delightful. She said, have you met Chris Hemsworth yet? And I said, yeah, I met him. She said, oh, well, well, what do you think? I said, f*** him. And she's laughing. She's, what do you mean, f*** him? I said, f*** him. He's six foot four. He's built like a brick shit house. I said, he's even got perfect skin. She's laughing. You said, you even notice he's got perfect skin? I said, yes. He's just sold his, an interest in his fitness app for $200 million. And I said, on top of that, he's the, he's a super nice guy and such a professional. I said, who the f*** deserves all of that? I said, just give it a bit of time. I'll find something wrong with him. Don't you worry. <laughs> but it was fun. And it's going to be another amazing shoot, like Fury Road. Fury Road, we often refer to as just old school. Like, none of the action in that is superfluous. Like, the action yeah. that they had, Tom Hardy to a shoot. George was Superman. very adamant. No twirling of weapons, as you said. Why would you do that and risk dropping it if your life right. depended on it? So everything was boots on the ground, which is more my style anyway. You know, I love that sort of uh, choreography. And Furious is the same. It's going to be amazing, slightly different than Fury, more of a storyteller. You're learning about a lot of people either and how different characters in Fury Road became who they were. It's 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 going to be incredible. It's the most expensive film I think we've ever shot in Australia. You know, huge budget, and George is just gifted. You, you know, I'd sit watching the monitor when George would be going through a scene, and it's like Rembrandt. You know, you could do a a, a drone shot, and figures would be this long, and he would be no move his feet six inches this way. No, no, put that person like there was nothing, no detail left untouched with George and. He's just incredible. And again, a, a lovely man. So I feel so fortunate to be able to work in such an iconic franchise like the Mad Max movies. And I just got to put a shout out to uh, Guy Norris, who I've worked with for 30 plus years, who was a second unit director, supervising coordinator. He's the one that hires me on those shoots. And I, again, feel very fortunate to be a part of it. Right. Incredible. Also did the last two um, Suicide Squad movies. You know, as fight coordinator on those. So I, I'm getting those, by the way, because unfortunately, the older you get, the less acting roles you are, unless you're going to play. I did a commercial audition the other day, and the commercial says, um, Granddad. 
And another one, grandpa. I'm like, for fuck's sake. <laughs> They're the roles I get. Now I'm probably going to play an aging gangster in whatever I do in the future, but it's okay. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, but, it, hey, at least you still have work coming. That's incredible, and it's always well, great to see you. Yeah, I, I just, uh, I feel, you know, then again, thank God for my journey. You know, it's an F message I often put out to younger kids in the martial arts that says, listen, if an asthmatic skinny kid from Croydon can end up working with legends like Summer Hong and Jackie Chan and Chuck Norris, and and basically two of the world rock and roll bands, it's all as a result of my through line of just wanting to be the best martial artist I could be. There's yeah. millions better. There's some not as good. That's totally irrelevant. I just, my through line with that, and I've often said everything good in my life has come as a result of just being a martial artist. So, Good, good times, and I've got a few roles. There's a there's a film in April that I'm doing uh, called Sacrifice. It's more an LGBTQ theme movie, and I'm playing a lifetime military dad who's got PTSD. He's on medication. His son is in the military, but gay. The dad doesn't believe he should be there. So there's a lot of friction there, wow. and no action whatsoever it's all drama and i'm really excited about that just because in fact the only reason i said yes when i was offered the role as i said i'm just saying yes because the role scares the shit out of me you know it's like i, I want something challenging now sure. like that so we'll see what happens wow uh so just a couple things before we uh finish up today uh i just wanted to very briefly touch upon the fact that you are also a brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt uh, which is incredible. Uh, and you got onto that pretty early on. So how, how did you, did you come to that through uh, Chuck Norris? Cause I know that he had already had some relationship with, with some of the Gracie's and, and maybe the Machado's in, 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 in LA. Is that, was that your introduction? Yeah, well, some of it was. Meeting and training with the Machado's was my introduction of them to Chuck in that. I'll tell you the quick story. That Chuck went to when we, in the early years in the uh, early eighties when we were training. Chuck went to Brazil with Bob Wall. You remember Bob Wall, O'Hara sure. and Nancy the Dragon. Yes. And and they went on a bit of a holiday to Brazil. They ended up in Rio. Being a martial artist, he asked around, "Well, what's the martial art everybody does?" Because again, BJJ wasn't on the map as it was certainly the way it is now. He ended up in a, in a school, in a jiu-jitsu school, with Elio Gracie, who Elio and Carlos Gracie are two godfathers of Brazilian yep. jiu-jitsu. Hickson Gracie, who you know is a legendary fighter of the Gracie family. Orion Gracie, who um, was Elio's son, one of his sons, and Hickson's brother, and, and also Hoist Gracie. So can you imagine that, you know, later on? Right. I mean, what a, a lineup that was. So he, he did a class with them. He ended up doing a little bit of a, a role because judo uh, Chuck was also a judo black belt at mm. the time. Figured he had a bit of a hang on grappling, so he has a little bit of a role with Elio Gracie. And Chuck tells me he was on top of Elio, and Elio suddenly says, Chuck, throw a punch at me. And Chuck said he's like, oh, Mr. Gracie, I couldn't do that. No, no, throw a punch at me. So he, Chuck says he half-heartedly throws his punch. Ilya grabs him in a collar choke, cross collar choke, you know, virtually chokes Chuck unconscious. Chuck said he couldn't eat for the next two days. His jaw was so sore. Wow. And that was the intro to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Another little funny part of that, by the way, is the part of the conversation, they're talking, you know, Hicks on and Hoist and them and Nora, and they're talking about what Brazilian, how superior it is to a lot of the arts. Bob Wall, apparently, out of the blue, just suddenly throws a front kick half-heartedly at Hoist. Hoist sort of jumped back, right? You can imagine this. And picks on, this is all according to Chuck, and I'm sure I'm paraphrasing, but jumps in and basically says to Bob Wall, oh, yeah, Bob says, oh, well, what would you do if somebody did that to you? You know, Bob being a karate guy, right? Being right. <laughs> affronted by a grappling guy. Uh, he said, what would you do if somebody did that? And, and Chuck said, Hickson stepped in front of Bob and said, why don't you try that on me? To which Chuck's freaking out, going, no, no, we, come on, we, we're just here, we're just interested in what you guys do and diffuse the whole thing, because you can imagine what that would have turned out like. Seriously, you know? yeah, especially a so young Hickson, wow. 
man. You know, he was the warrior. And so Hickson comes back. Oh, sorry, Hickson. Chuck comes back to America and with a VHS video of the early Valley Tudor fights that Hickson did against Zulu and some of the legendary no rules matches he had then, which again, as we know now, is a bit of a precursor to the type of fights they do in the UFC. So when he Chuck shows that device, and we're looking at it, I think, wow, this is fascinating stuff. I ended up finding Horion Gracie, I forget how, found out it was in LA. I gave Horion a call and said, look, I you know, introduced myself on the phone and said, I'd love to see what you guys do. I told him a bit of my background. He had he was living in Renondo Beach in LA, and that's where he was teaching private. None of them had a school at that time. But they didn't even have a club. None of them had academies in LA or anything. Hickson was treat, uh, training people out of Horion's garage. And so I ended up going there and doing private lessons with Hickson. Wow. And, and I'd like to tell a story which I have told before. I'll tell it again that the first thing Hickson said to me, because he knew my background as a stand-up fighter, he says, oh, my friend, you want to put the gloves on? And I said, luckily, I said, no, 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 no. I just, I just really want to see what you guys do. So the very intro was Hoyce laying on his back, and I had to sit on top of him in the mount, as we now know, and try and stay there. No striking, of course. Then Hoist got on top of me and I had to try and get him off, both of which were impossible. And again, as I have often said, I walked away from that lesson going, I felt like a little baby on the ground with these guys. I have to add it. And the key point is not do it instead of, I said, I have to add it to what I already do. Because sure. I just immediately saw how good these guys were. Trained with Hicks on for whatever, eight, nine months, would go to his house a couple times a week. And um, I eventually met Henza Gracie, who asked me who I was training with. And I said, oh, I'm doing lessons at Horion's house with Hickson. He said, oh, you need to meet my cousins, the Machados. And I said, okay. And this was in Australia, by the way. I ended up going back to L.A. Henza was going back to New York or wherever. I might have been Brazil. He was still in there. I can't remember what he Uh set up Uh in New York. And he, he, we ended up meeting, so I met the Machados. Uh, Jean-Jacques and one of the other brothers wasn't even in the country then. They also were all teaching the garage out Hermosa Beach way. So I ended up doing a lesson with them and just fell in love with the way they taught and everything else. So I became a student. Um, they opened up a school eventually in the Valley. That was through Chuck and Bob Wall and myself established their first school in or academy in Encino. They eventually opened up out past the beach, out past the airport in Hermosa, Redondo Beach way. But I, uh, Chuck, through all of this, and again, I, I, I just can't remember the exact order of things, but because I was training with Horion, Chuck ended up inviting Horion to teach at his UFAF seminar, which is the United Fighting Arts Federation seminar, and he held in Vegas every year. So Horion in the very early 80s ended up there with Pedro Sawyer, who's another incredibly high-ranking sure. jiu-jitsu man. Uh, Hickson was part of it. Also Carlos Machado, one of the Machados who was there. But Chuck never got a relationship with Carlos, and he was just part of this group. So Horion and his group ended up teaching for a couple of years. I, in the meantime, started training with the Machados, and I said, Chuck, you've got to train with these guys. They're unbelievable not only because of their school, but their personalities in that I've often said, even today, I've wrestled a lot of those guys a thousand times, not once have they hurt me, and right. yet with absolute total control over me. And I, I always respected that, you know. So Chuck says, we'll bring them around to the house. He was living in Tarzana at the time, you know, one of the suburbs of L.A., and he said, bring him, we'll do a private. He said, get him for two hours. And I said, I'm not sure you want two hours already knowing how grilling it was. So <laughs> I think it was uh, Higan Machado, who was the real champion of the family, and Carlos, they came out, did a lesson. The rest is history. They formed a relationship with Chuck. Carlos Machado moved to Texas, you know, Dallas, and originally due to Chuck being there doing Walker, Texas Ranger, they formed a relationship so it was really due to Henzo introducing me to Machado's, me training with him in the garage, bringing him out to Chuck's house and having him actually train with them that started a, a relationship that lasts till today. Um, wow. It's quite a journey. Um, yeah, so I, 
I'm now a sixth black stripe or sixth degree in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Got mm-hmm. a nice degree from Hicks and Gracie, which was memorable seeing he was the one that introduced me to my whole BJJ journey. I was grade the fifth degree with Higa Machado. Trained with John Jacques for a long time. So anyway, I've had a, a long and incredible history with Jiu Jitsu and I just love it. It's probably the most complex art that I've ever done. The reason being, as you would know, with traditional arts, traditional arts tend to stay the way they are or were, whether it's 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, whereas the Brazilian jiu-jitsu evolves yeah. almost by the week. And the UFC, of course, started that evolution because of the competition and, and the Gracies putting jiu-jitsu on the map. So many competitions, they allow the evolution. Like the jiu-jitsu I did 10 years ago is so different to what I'm doing today due to people like John Danaher and yeah. it changed the art from no longer about just upper body. They brought in the whole leg attack system. Leg locks, which, yeah. Yeah, which changes the way you pass a guard, the way you defend a guard. I mean, it changes everything. But, you know, in fact, when I was doing jiu-jitsu in the early days, if you attacked the legs, yes, you did foot locks and, and fundamental leg attacks. But basically, if you attacked the legs, it was almost considered dirty pool, you know, right. like your jiu-jitsu right. is not good. Cut to the Danhers and um, another gentleman who said, why would you ignore half of the body 50% of the time? And right. it made sense. So it's just changed the whole game and obviously for the better. So I just enjoy it because I feel with jiu-jitsu as long. And a lot of the other arts, I often say to people, the, the great thing about what we do is I've been in martial arts now for, what, 62, 63 years. I said, every day I wake up, I have a chance to learn something new. And I say, you have that opportunity, provide you have the desire to do so. And that's that's what I love about the arts in general, and particularly jiu-jitsu. It it's never stops evolving, and that excites me because I can be, be a white belt tomorrow, depending on who I'm training with. And I think that's quite exciting. Wow. Incredible and such a great mindset to have. Uh, last, real quick, quick answers. What was the most fun film you ever made? You know, that's a hard one to answer because uh, the, the fun films, without even being specific, are ones that I did in the Philippines. I just loved it because there was no budget, no money. I did films for Roger Corman. You know, and you by everybody just kicked in and did what you had to do to get the film made. You know, I've often said with bigger budget movies, where your name appears on the call sheet sort of dictates how you're treated. With this, it was just all in your made up ridiculous stunts and fights on the day and you just did them. So that was fun. Most fun is doing something like City Hunter and seeing how you turn out in a movie like that because you're sure. exercise it too early and not aware while you're doing it, how it's going to be. And you just, I just cracked up. But Mr. Nice Guy, same thing. I mean, you saw me, I'm just an over-the-top gangster because right. I couldn't even laugh like, <laughs> Sam, we no, you have a cigar and you slick your hair back. I remember saying to Sam, I said, can't I just look like an ordinary bad guy, Sam? Why do I have to look like a fucking idiot with my hair slicked back and a cigar? No, 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 it's good. He wanted me to puff away in that cigar and do all uh-huh. that stuff. And <laughs> even laughing, it had to be, ha, ha, ha. So anyway. Fun from that point of view. And finally, what is your favorite fight scene of yours to watch in in hindsight? Oh, I, I would agree with you. For me, it's still that fight scene with Sammo in Twinkle Twinkle. Just because it was the first Hong Kong movie, it was so different to anything else I would have or had done in the future. Although I would say I do absolutely uh, adore the fights that we did in Magic Crystal. You know, I think they yes. were so inappropriate. But Twinkle Twinkle just stands out for me just because it was the first one of that particular genre for me. Right. right. And you can also say you work with Andy Lau, too, which is a pretty big flex now because Andy Lau is like one of the and top. I, it's incredible. Incredible. Well, hey, and, this, and, and, yes. and, and it's now, you know, I didn't. Andy Magic Chris was one of Andy's first movies coming basically from television. Right. Who knew? Right. And, you know, in uh, Twinkle Twinkle, Michelle Yeoh was in that doing a judo scene with Summer on who knew right now. She's massive at the it's time. Huge. 
Yeah. Didn't know, but yeah. <laughs> Incredible. Hey, this was so much fun talking with you. It was an absolute honor and a pleasure. I hope we can do it again sometime. I hope we can do it face to face. That would be amazing. Yeah, I'd love it, Alex. There's so many more stories to tell. As I'm I said, sure I, we got to do a part two. <laughs> yeah, I would, I would love to talk about more of those lessons learned in my yes. journey. It, it's it's been amazing, and I'd love to pass on some of those so-called lessons. You know, they, they, they're good stories, and I think they're very informative, you know, to a lot of the listeners out there, you know. Absolutely. Well, I, I highly encourage you to finish that book. And if you need any help, I've written a few. So get that book wonderful. out there. Yeah, excellent. Hey, by the way, don't forget, you you need to, and I ask you this, and I'm saying this online, you need to do uh, a a podcast with Barry Peng, you know, yes. because yes. in the stories he has regarding Bruce Lee and William Chung in the early years, I just had lunch with Barry a few weeks ago and it just blew me away. And I wow. know you with your connection right up, with right up things. my alley. <laughs> oh my God. It's, it's phenomenal. Some of the lessons he has and everything else. And also I want to tell you the early years with William Chung when he came to Melbourne, so much else to talk about. And so wow. of the, We'll definitely have to do that then. Anime. That'll be awesome. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, thank you so much. It was an absolute pleasure. Thank you, Richard Norton. You're welcome. Thank you, Alex. And all the best, all the blessings to all the viewers out there. Thank you. All right, everyone. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of The Kung Fu Genius. And as always, don't forget to subscribe to The Kung Fu Genius. Hit that bell for notifications. Support us on Patreon. And if you have any questions for a future episode, you got to be on Patreon. And I'll see you guys next time. Word is I'm a kung fu genius. Technique speaks for me, not lineage. Forget Jet Li, cause I'm the one. Many call me Sifu, but to you I'm Si Kung. And I produce masters. You surpassed us. Your kung fu stiffer than corpse and caskets. City Wing Chung is the house I built. Violate the gate and your blood gets spilt. Alex Richter, always the victor. In fact, he moved opposite to where I lived, and he was disappearing. Oh, oh my I think we lost your camera there, Richard. <laughs> oh, my God. That's Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Don't worry about it. <laughs> I'm surprised it didn't happen on our end first. <laughs> it's, a, it's a new one. I only just got this, this one. It. <laughs> oh, that's really great. Oh, no, now I've, I've wrecked the hole. Bit of editing already for you, Alex. That's, See, okay. um, <laughs> it's the, that's the editor's problem. That's not even my problem. There we go. Oh, we're good again, are we? Yes, good. yes, yes, yes. So we talk about the physical ah. strength from the judo. Uh, yeah, I'm not. So, I'm not here to protect you from them. I'm here to protect them from you. That's right. All right. Okay. <laughs> sorry, you are not sorry. Not sorry.